Good afternoon, everybody. This is Walter Linney with the NCC. I'd like to welcome everyone to the third National Healthcare Associated Infections Learning and Action Network event. The patient, engaging the most important member of your infection prevention team. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, in order to reduce background noise, we have muted all lines. To unmute, please press star six. Um, again, please press star six. Uh, to unmute your lines. Um, and we also have a chat function in WebEx. Um, please feel free to use that if you have any questions for myself, Vicky, um, our speakers, or the group as a whole. Uh, I now have the pleasure of introducing the MCC's Assistant Director of Quality Improvement, Ms. Vicki Cash. Vicki, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Walter. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. All right. Well, welcome, everybody, um, and we're so happy to have you joining us, depending on where you are in the country. It's either 4 p.m. or 1 o'clock in the afternoon, but hopefully you're wrapping up your day. And um, we are very um, thrilled to have some patients join us today who are our honored guests, and they're going to speak to us about some of their experiences um, with preventing infection. And it's such a timely topic uh, out there in the community really looking at how we can engage patients and caregivers in the um, together as a team. And infection control is one of the greatest ways that we can involve both the patient and the provider um, to staff out healthcare associated infections. Um, so why is this so important? I just kind of want to set the stage for um, what we're doing today and uh, what we hope to hear. And the meeting we're going to hear from patients about the impact of these infections in their lives, as well as ways that patients and caregivers have been engaged to prevent infections. Talk about some communication strategies that patients can use their care partners as they're talking with health providers. And then look at some real life examples where this has happened and the improvements that we've seen. And um, review the tools that you could use for, to uh, start working with you. To just give you a little um, overview of the importance of this topic and, and what is uh, really a problem across the nation with healthcare associated infections, I wanted to review some of the um, information related to ESRD. Uh, you know, CMS has released their national quality strategy. And this is part of that Healthy People 2020 plan. And they're really looking at three very focused areas, better care, healthy people, and affordable care. These are broad spectrums. And when you look at better care, obviously, one of the biggest drivers is lowering mortality. And in the MCH Mental Disease Population, I have to look at patients with central lines, 37,000 uh, were uh, experienced bloodstream infections. And one in four of those patients are at risk of death. So this is pretty dramatic when we look at that particular population. Um, improved morbidity. Well, hospitalization rates have increased 47% for uh, blood two infections and 80%, 87% for vascular access infections since 1993. And both of these pieces of data come out of our US RDS database. So we're really working against the curve with a lot of infections um, coming about. And then if you look at the cost associated with infections, just general cost of admissions across all acute care systems, we're talking close to six to seven billion dollars in a 2006 figure. So, um, you know, when we really look to align ourselves with the goals of the Medicare program, this is a key area for improvement. And just a little other information about um, HAIs in the ESRD population. Well, to change the slide, please. So, the impact of HIV and ESRD, hospital, uh, hemodialysis patients are hospitalized twice a year, and one in ten of those hospitalizations are due to a healthcare associated infection. And again, I think we've shared this statistic with you guys all before, if you've been on any of our other calls. Um, infection is the second leading cause of death in the ESRD population. Um, and why are our patients so at risk? Let's take a look at that. If you change the slide, Walter. 
So I love this time for my last presentation. I just have to bring it out again. Um, you know, it is the perfect storm, especially in the hemodialysis setting. Um, there's just a lot of potential for breaks in process because of our short turnover times. There's not a lot of separation in our community, in our environment, in our dialysis setting. We have people that are taking care of multiple patients. Obviously, lots of blood around. Um, high risk for the spread of pathogens. And then we add in the fact that our patients are compromised. So, you know, it really is the perfect storm in a hemodialysis setting. Let me continue to slide up. And um, what we'd like to do is really work on getting our patients engaged. Um, this is a definition, and we're really excited that AHRQ released their toolkit about patient engagement. And it has a lot of really important tools about safety, and one of those being involved in patients and uh, infection control. So we'll define patient engagement as the act of involving patients and their families as active partners in planning, delivery, and evaluation of patient care. So what better than having them be part of your infection control team. Get to the next slide, Walter. And um, I wanted to also share with you, this is not just, you know, something that the nation is focused on or, you know, the hot topic for America. It's actually a world focus. So if you look at the World Health Organization, and they really have done some excellent work in the hand hygiene strategy, and they say it's a critical approach to improving safety, the involvement of patients. So um, with that in mind, if you change the slide, Walter. I wanted to bring to uh, the table a couple of patients that actually work with us in our national team. Um, they are dialysis patients, and they have real-life experience in the setting. And I think it's very compelling to hear their story and you know, understand the impact on their life. And, and I think that that's some really great key takeaways. So our first patient is a gentleman by the name of Jasper Travis. And he currently lives in Jacksonville, Florida, with his wife of 25 years, who are coming up on an anniversary of like Jasper of Super Bowl. First. Super Bowl oh. Sunday. Oh, good. Yeah. That'll be very nice. And uh, Jasper served in our country's military as a major in the Army for two tours in Vietnam. He retired in 1985. He has a bachelor's degree in world history and a master's degree in world history from Virginia, Virginia Tech. And right now I just say, go Hokies, because that's... Go Hokies. Go Hokies. <laughs> uh, he is an active member of his Network 7. Um, land group and the board of directors. He is the chairman of the Patient Advisory Committee and in 2014 had the honor of being named the Volunteer of the Year. Uh, he is a member of our patient land, the National Patient Land, and he works with our REACH group which has focused on connecting patients to patients. And he really puts the hours in at his current center being a peer mentor and a friendly face to so those who are new to dialysis um, and have to have someone to talk to and help them get through. So Jasper is uh, committed to improving the care of the patients around him and helping those. So we really appreciate him being here today because I think um, his sharing his story is going to be powerful to understand how his involvement and, and what happened to him um, could change healthcare associated infections going forward. So thank you, Jasper, for agreeing to talk with us today. And does that talk a little bit about yourself and how long you've been on dialysis? Thank you, Kathy. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thank you for having me on your uh, panel. Uh, my name is Jasper Travis, as you said. Uh, I've been on dialysis in June, the state of the old state. I came to dialysis where I was put my kidney uh, on my birthday. I went to the hospital. I got chicken pox. And that figured it's not my kidney consumption on my birthday, but uh, I have to say that uh, I am blessed, and I'm glad it, not glad it happened, but it made me to realize life. I value life. Uh, my infection started, uh, I went to dialysis one morning, and I had a scab on my fistula, and the nurses there 
uh, refused to vandalize them because I'm scared. So we had a back girl sent around the corner. So they sent me around the corner to, uh, be, uh, to see what was wrong. The doctor said it would be okay, so we put a band-aid across his hair and sent me back to dialysis. And I was dialyzed. I went home. Good thing my wife had retired then. I was sitting in the den, and all of a sudden, my fisherman just started shooting out like a starfish. I mean, blood was all over the wall. She wasn't too happy about that. Blood was everywhere. So she called 911. Good thing now uh, the uh, rescue squad was around the corner from where we left. The EMT told me that if I, they had been five minutes late, I would have bled out. So my thing is, when I got to the hospital, uh, the doctor said, well, uh, is there a new patient? I mean, a new staff member there. I said, yeah, we just had a new LPN, and she had just got a tattoo. And I was conscious of her washing her hands. She said, well, you have an infection. I said, oh, so they admitted me to um, ICU. I stayed there for three days. Uh, took some, uh, I'm looking at it now. Uh, I'm going to discharge paper. Uh, I-B-F-O-R-T-A-C. Had to do that for three times, and after I got out of the hospital, uh, 30 minutes after post the house. So, after then, I started watching the, uh, nurses washing their hands, and that is one of my big things of hand washing. And I had to really show them what the, what the, uh, army taught me at, uh, Brooks Army Medical Center, because I was a medic, uh, how to wash their hands. Some of the things that have the foot pedals, they have the faucet, they would wash their hands, they cut the faucet off with their hands. I said, no, 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 the paper towel that you wash your hand with, that's the one you turn the faucet off with. And that was an educational moment for both parties, for them to learn how to wash their hands, and for me to wash them, wash their hands. And Jeff, I think you had a, a particular experience with one caregiver that um, was new, right? And, and you saw some errors in what they were doing. And, and how did you work through that? Uh, but just by, I think I got a gift with Jeff. So uh, just by talking to him, I am not out for a witch hunt, but we all, I'm there for the patient. And uh, I guess the nurse is there for us too. So we just talk. And I told, and I told them the correct way of how to wash their hands and how I got the infection. You see, it's not important and it doesn't faze you until it happens to you. Then you start noticing everything around you. Uh, and Ralph, uh, you told me something really great about this lady that you worked with that was new and maybe making some mistakes. What, what, how did that turn around after you guys worked together? Okay, after, that's the same as they had to say to them. And uh, she, as I got back to the house, she just came and sat on the floor and said, she's so sorry, she's so sorry. I said, no problem about that. Let's work together with this. And now she is the best nurse there. I uh, mention her to be one of our peer support. It's not to, you know, I, I don't want to say to belittle anybody. But we work together, and now she's one of the best nurses there at the dialysis clinic. So that's a, a really great outcome. She was kind of new. Yeah, she was new. She had just got her LPN. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. And what did that experience teach you about yourself? It taught me to watch, listen, and learn. And see, if you see one, do one. Uh, just to watch about, because my picture is my lifeline. That's the only thing we have there. And I asked a lot of patients, why do they go to sleep at the houses? And they told me because they feel comfortable, because most of them are home by themselves. They feel if something go wrong, there'll be somebody there to help them. And by that infection, I've noticed the uh, staff, everybody's washing their hands, and when they wipe their hands, they always wink at me. <laughs> 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 so I would raise, raise over here. 
The other thing that really, when I talk to you about what happened, you tell me that the, the, the head nurse got it all with folks together after this infection came out and really talked to them about what they were doing and they reviewed the procedures again and you saw a change in your whole clinic just from kind of everybody talking it through and paying attention to it. Right, and I was living at home that uh, conference. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, so you were part of it. Yeah, she invited me in on the conference. Oh, awesome. And, they, and everybody just kind of uh, talked with you and you shared your experiences and, and you saw the changes start to happen after that, correct? After, after that, correct. Great, great. And I think you had something you wanted to leave us with. I know before you were... Um, uh, you I, have you share with, I have nothing to share with the group. There was a... Do you mind if I... Uh, it happened to me again. Do you mind? Go ahead. Okay, there was a a patient that went to dialysis, and uh, the nurse had graduated. So the patient told the nurse that he didn't feel well that morning. So she said, "Well, okay, I'll get back with you." Let me put the other patients on. This was six fifteen in the morning. At ten fifteen, the nurse came back to that patient and told him, uh, "I heard you wasn't feeling good." The patient told him, hey, it's time to go home now. I've been here all this time. Uh, the patient went home around 4 o'clock that afternoon and started having chest pain. And so when he went, his wife looked at his insurance to make sure everything was all right. She took him to the hospital. And the triage nurse there listened to him. And all of a sudden, they brought a wheelchair out. And they rushed him to the ICU. The patient had wanted new bone. My the question was, if the nurse had listened to his reason a uh, cracking the sound when he walked to the house, they would have noticed that. So my thing is, do the nurse really hear what the patient is saying? My thing is, don't be so involved in the sickness, but get to know the patient. You know, that patient, they rush you to, I stayed in ICU three days, and that patient was me. Uh, my thing is, I'm on dialysis four hours a day, 12 hours a week, 48 hours a month, and I'm on dialysis 2,496 hours per year. You think you don't know what something is wrong with me if I don't feel good? It might not be my, my, uh, dialysis. It might not be my, uh, kidney. It could be that coming, coming to dialysis, someone's cutting out. It could be anything. Get to know the patient. That is my thing. And I would like to leave with the group. So let me just say I was blessed. I said that before, but it is important because I am not complaining here. Uh, if I am, I know I do not, do not have a privilege. On the other hand, when you're in your skimpy hospital gown, under a cold blanket, there really isn't much to say about privilege. The world of sickness is hardly unequal, but I am also here to tell you that it is a privilege that can't get the wrong care or be the wrong victim of this judgment. People are always saying that medicine is as much a science as an art, but until I believe it and saw it for myself, I've been on dialysis, I've been a dialysis patient long enough to have run across some bad nurses and take. But somehow, I held on to the feeling that because medicine, unlike the law, is a science. Not everyone knows how to deal with illness. Sick people are still the same people, except they are scared, physically, and emotionally. What they need is generally a good laugh, a good story, or just a hug, or a squeeze of the hand. But, but but some people disappear when they hear that you are sick. Pain is really a terrible thing. It changes you in every way that matters. I did my best to tolerate the pain, to put on a good show of it. But if you have suffered from serious pain, you will probably understand nothing is sweeter than the absence of it. Everyone who gets sick will tell you, tell you that, Anyone who gets sick will tell you it changes them. 
but that's not always so. I hope being sick would teach me to appreciate what I have and to be grateful and thankful to live life understanding it is embrace it will embrace you just the more. I hope I can be a better husband, better friend, a better human <laughs> kid. And the recovery is remember to be grateful and forget not to be terrified. Now we have to hear and thank you all for listening to attention. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jasper. I know it's a powerful sentiment, so I appreciate your sharing that with us and your experiences. And obviously, um, some very real life touches with healthcare associated infection, um, and, and some great stories about how you were able to improve that working with the team. And that team seems like a great group to be brought you in and, and really listened and, and have shown great improvement. So, really, we have a good facility, a great sense of facility. Great. That's so wonderful. Thank you. And then we have another question. Elizabeth Kimball, are you on? You might have to hit star six, Elizabeth, if we can't hear you. Are you there, Elizabeth? Right now we can't hear you if you're talking. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you, Elizabeth, and welcome. So Elizabeth is lives in Portland, Oregon. And uh, she lives with her husband and their dog, which I don't have their dog's name, Elizabeth. What's your doggy's name? Junior. Junior, okay. And she is an active net, uh, member of Network 16 and also a member of our national land. And she's with our Phoenix Rising Group, which does a lot of work with transplants. Um, and she also works for the National Kidney Foundation, volunteers for Meals on Wheels at our local community center, and enjoys cooking and baking and daily walks. And I know, Elizabeth, today you wanted to share with us your experience um, with infection and um, trying uh, working with your patient care team, some of the things that you learned. So um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what happened? Sure. Uh, thank you, everyone, for inviting me to be a part of your panel. My name is Elizabeth. I'm 44, uh, 45 years old. I've been married for 22 years. Um, we have no kids, but my dog is my little baby. I um, started dialysis initially when I was 12 years old, and I had different modalities of treatment, including two transplants, one from a deceased donor, and the second one in 1990 from my mother. That gave me less than 13 wonderful years. And believe me when I tell you, when I said 13 wonderful years, is because they were the most wonderful years I believe throughout my life before, you know, or after I got sick. Um, my my challenge, you know, it, we all have everyday challenge, but people who are sick, those are challenges that we encounter the most, especially dialysis. We go there and we find out that our fistula is flat or the catheter is not working. My... Um, the infection that I had, it was a UTI that I, that I had, and I did not know I had a UTI because my kidneys do not work at all, so I make no urine at all. So I was having lower backache, and I was feeling the frequency to go to the bathroom, but I just didn't pay attention, so I sort of brushed it off, and when I went to dialysis, they would ask me, is everything, everything okay, any changes, any passing, you know, all of that stuff that they go through, the, you know, asking patients, and I said, no, I'm fine, I'm good, I didn't have no cough, none of that, but I didn't mention to the nurse that I was having lower backache, and I can see the, you know, to have to go pee, so... It, you know, one week it turned into a month and it would go off. Then I would get back the, uh, the symptoms and it would go. And so this went on for about a year, okay? So one day I just woke up and I wasn't myself. My husband said to me, honey, it's time, you know, for you to start getting ready because you have to go to dialysis. And I don't know what was best to me to just start crying and to say, I'm not going to dialysis because I'm going to die. 
But he, he, I mean, he was devastated to hear this from me. I went to bed fine, and here I am now saying, I was talking incoherent. I was just not myself. So he called 911 and called dialysis unit, and so they told him that I needed to go to, you know, to the hospital. What it turned out to be, it was a UTI. But it took a few days for the doctors to actually find out that it was a UTI because, like I said, I don't make it in urine. They check everything they could, everything was okay. They even had to put a catheter to see if they could get any urine, but there was none. So this went on for a few days. Here I am, you know, talking to the walls. Um, and one day, the doctor, it, he was right behind the um, the drapes, and he comes in and he says to me, who are you talking to? And I said, the, the lady sitting there. And all of a sudden, I told, I turned to him and I said, I have to go. He's so bad. I said, I, I just have to go. And then he said to me, oh, my gosh, I think I do know what you have. And he said, I'll be right back. Then he came back and he said, you have a UTI, Elizabeth, and we need to give you some antibiotics. Now, the problem was that when he ordered the antibiotics, we didn't have them here in the whole state of Oregon. He had to come from uh, California. So I had to wait, you know, overnight to get these antibiotics. But the moment I got the antibiotics, I just started feeling better. Like the next day, I was more clear-headed, you know. And so my experience was really awful because I did not know what it was and no one knew. And so my husband was, like I said, he was, I think it was worse for my husband to see me, you know, talking. So it did. I mean, I have never talked like that before, like, I'm just going to die and stuff like that. It, it was really awful. Not only that, but since the, uh, the, the infection has spread to the blood system and then to the brain, it just made me start, I was acting really um, incoherent and kind of crazy. <laughs> it became that serious for so long. And, and what was, you know, I know you said to me that, you know, what you wanted to share with the audience was uh, just speaking up and listening to patients and, and the importance of kind of sharing all of this information openly. Yes. I, you know, what I, for me, I have to say that as a patient, I have responsibilities it's not just the staff. No. I, my responsibility is to communicate every symptom that I feel, whether it's new or something that has been persistent. You know, i got to communicate. Have an open communication with the staff, with the nurse. Because I know that if I would have told the nurse I've been having the symptoms, she would have said, well, you need to go see your nephrologist. And then we would have had this UTI immediately instead of going on for over a year and then end up in the uh, emergency, you know. So in my part, I failed because I did not communicate. So what did I learn from my own experience is that I need to communicate every little detail, everything that I feel, whether, you know, it's something that's persistent, like I said, or something new. I need to communicate these to the RN or my nephrologist because it is really important to communicate without that. And I also share the same thing that Jasper was talking about. You know, I sit there for every other day for three, four hours and observe. I am very, you know, when it comes to making sure that my chair is clean, because there have been times where they tell me, oh, and that, it, you know, the chair is ready, but when I look, there is blood. It might be a speck or it might be a little blood, but I have to let them know, okay, it's not ready, so that way they think it. And also, with the text, make sure that they have clean hands and you change the glove because it had happened to me where they put the glove, they're ready to put me on the machine and 
he or she forgot something, so she goes and opens the drawers and get a two-by-two or get fuel with the same, you know, with the gloves. So I point out to the tech, do you mind changing the glove because you just touch, you know, the or the stool? And I make sure that I told them it's nothing personal. It's just that we don't want any infection. I don't want any infection. And so... It's very important to communicate and making sure that they are following all these little uh, techniques that they need to, washing their hands or putting new gloves. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's very important to have communication, you know, to uh, open communication with the staff and collaborate with them. Yeah, and I think the way that you share it with the staff is, is very appropriate, Elizabeth, and, and I'm sure people, you know, we're busy and we're moving around and we forget our stuff, and as long as we all work as a team, we can um, make the environment as safe as possible. So thank you both for your stories. I, I think it really kind of helps us focus in on like, you know, the real human aspect and how easy it is for you all to, you know, for something to slip and an infection to happen and be very life threatening for um for you both. So we appreciate your time and um, I would like to maybe hold the questions to the end of the program. I mean uh, Jasper and Elizabeth you can hold on. Um, what we'd like to do now is um be able to focus on a little bit of ways to um, work with your patients and maybe a program that you could all consider um or starting something like it that works out in our um, network 16. So first let me share with you this um was uh what's up on the screen now is a toolkit that I referenced before from um ARC and it is a great tool in terms of containing cultural safety materials, checklists. It has a wonderful video about uh, patient HAI experience and HRD. And, uh, you know, what if you did to improve that, you might want to share that with your team. So this is a, a very robust toolkit that just got released on, uh, last week, I believe, the 29th of January. Uh, or, you know, earlier than that, the 24th or something. So uh, please visit the site and use these tools. Walker, if you can change the slide. And then, of course, you know, the two five moments, I think it's one of the best tools they have around, especially that shows confidence and, and your team, you know, think about when to watch for head washing questions. This is an excellent tool that we always emphasize. You can change the slide, Walker. And then up to the back, you missed the show. And this was another thing that's found in the ARC materials. And so this is just a little bit of a uh, contract, a patient contract. I think you, many of you may have seen this before. But it kind of talks about some of the things that Elizabeth mentioned about what her responsibilities are and then what the team's responsibilities. It's a great way to work with patients and establish that um, involvement in their care. And then uh, slide, or we can Okay, so um, if we are looking to reduce, not just reduce APIs, but actually eliminate them, and we really find that it's crucial to include um, patients in that process. So I wanted to focus our last half of the presentation on an actual quality improvement project that happened out in um, Network 16, and Barbara Bleckler, uh, the quality uh, director from that network is on the line, was one of her patients who participated in this real-life example and can share with you the results, and I hope this gives you ideas and, and strategies that you can use in your setting. So, Barbara, are you there? So let's talk about what actually happened in, uh, in Network 16. Maybe. Oh. There we go. So we actually have a patient land, just like everybody else does. And, of course, our lands uh, for 2014 had to come up with different campaigns. We had, in 2014, 18 uh, ESRD patient advisors on our land. And they actually selected infection control as a 2014 campaign. Uh, as those of you that are on the, uh, the call that are from networks or maybe in facilities that participated, you know that uh, the quality section of our contracts had us working with at least 20% of our facilities on doing hand hygiene and other CDC audit tools. 
So the picture ran, and I got together, and we decided that we would have the same facility actually have patients from safe hand hygiene audits. So because of the verbiage in the contract, we not only had 20% of the facilities represented, we actually had 20% of the network uh, population represented. So the aim of this infection control campaign was to assist facilities representing 20% of Northwest Renal Network's population, prevent dialysis patient infections, and we wanted to see a 10% relative improvement by the end of 2014. So what did we do? Uh, we had patient observations using the CDC hand hygiene observation tool, and we wanted a minimum of 10 patient observations per month. The monthly data submission, uh, meaning the number of patient audits completed for the month, and the number of those that were successful were submitted to the network every month. So this is a copy of the tool. I think everybody's seen it. Uh, as you can imagine, we got a fair bit of concern, both from patients uh, and from facilities, with having patients actually perform audits. So to help alleviate some of the concern that patients had, we didn't actually have them fill out the complete tool. And I'll show you here in a moment the wording we had on our instructions that we actually gave to patients. Okay, so here are our instructions. Uh, of course, we thank them for helping us uh, improve the quality of care in their facility. Talked about how infection is very, prevention is very important and how they can actually help monitor the practices. We didn't want to assume the patients would know every single time that hand hygiene should occur. So we gave them a list, as you can see in the bulls, of just very general times that hand hygiene should be performed. We also kept it pretty general to make sure that no matter which provider, nothing that we put on this list would be counterindicated by that provider's actual policies and procedures. Uh, in the second page, we actually talked about how to uh, fill out the form. We did have them put the facility name and date. We did not have them fill out any of that other demographic information. So not what shift, uh, not what time of day, anything that would be able to limit it down so that whoever compiled the audits could tell which patient actually completed it. That helps eliminate some of the concern about any kind of retaliation. And then we just have general instructions that go along with the CDC hand hygiene audit. Uh, so this is, you know, using a N for a nurse or a T for a tech, and there were other examples down at the bottom. Uh, we did not want them specifically pointing out any person, just like those tools to punch, no matter who fills them out specifically, they still didn't do this correctly. Uh, we told them, you know, for to put check marks if the opportunity was successful. Uh, and then we let them know that uh, they didn't have to fill out anything at the bottom of the page to make sure to turn in the form at the end of their dialysis treatment to either the charge nurse or facility manager. Uh, we did let them know that the facility would send their results into us. And we did ask them not to speak to talk about missed opportunities. So this would be missed hand hygiene audits, unless it was the tech or nurse that was dealing with that patient's care directly. Uh, we did not want to set up a hostile situation or somebody going across the line, et cetera. So I know this sounds great hearing it for me, but I actually have a patient on the line that has complete some of these. So while we grew up in a small, rural farm community, where the parents consistently emphasized the benefit of learning. She's a firm believer in education, as when one is knowledgeable, one is empowered at quality to one's life. She's been a dialysis patient for nine years and is diligent about learning and how best to deal with her kidney disease. She's constantly asking questions, seeking information, and finding learn knowledge, and being proactive to talk to her quality for her life as she deals with the SRD. Uh, Robin has a master's degree in education. She's been an educator for over 40 years and she's been a member of Network 16's patient lineup. Hey, Devin, uh, will you give it a try to talk? If we can't hear you, you might need to hit pound six so that we can hear you. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Great. Can you still hear me? Yep, keep going. 
Oh, okay. So, I just start? Yes. Just tell us about your experience with the hand hygiene audit. Okay, well, when I started, the LAN network, the network 16 really opened my eyes. And I did lose a graft to infection. And I have really realized that infection is the number two part of mortality. And that it's a huge challenge to diminish it. Um, when I first started the hand hygiene audits, um, it was because of the focus of Network 16. And at my unit, we did it in September as a practice audit because we were not one of the ones that was originally designated. But we did it so we could better understand it as I was on the network. That would give me more information. And before we started the audit, I kind of thought my unit was doing an adequate job of it, adhering to best practices for hand, hand, hand hygiene. Once I was better educated, I still soon found out that baseline was low and that best practices were not consistent with all caregivers. I was also concerned about patients completing the audits so they would be viable results. And I really found out that there needs to be really great education for patients doing um, the audits. And for staff compliance, I found that before the audit, um, and a strong focus on hand hygiene from management and staff compliance was weak. Um, there were a few that adhered to best practices, but really many did not. I saw failure, failure to um, realize shared computers, gowns, uh, chairs, machines have a high germ count, and washing and changing gloves after usage is enough. I saw staff touching contaminated items without washing and changing gloves before working with a patient. Staff go on break or returning without washing. And I also saw doctors, really a lot of them, fail to wash or change gloves between uh, patients. And at first, the staff, you know, to, to engage them in a dialogue was somewhat difficult because even though not criticizing when he made comments, it wasn't well received. It seemed that many, you know, thought it was about who was right and who was in charge. But once the audits began and management stepped in also to do education, a shift in communication and in focus on high I can't hygiene really, really took place. Unit management made best practices, um, the hygiene uh, focus for all staff. Patients were doing audits and staff weekly, if not more often, met to reiterate best practices. Management and observers from outside the unit closely um, were closely watching to see how staff employed best practices in hand hygiene. The results were early addressed. And I think that... Uh, Go in hand, the communication, the working together with management was the key because it wasn't just the patient saying something to the um, team, the staff, and it wasn't just when they had their huddle meetings and things. Management truly backed this, and it was a truly educational uh, setting, and it was, they took it to heart. They really took it to heart, and boy, what a change. Um, and I think a change for this is that I really realize with the proper education and a consistent focus, big changes can occur. Um, there was significant, significant improvement on how, you know, staff employed it. Now it's not something they have to stop and think about before they do or they don't have to be reminded. It's automatic. You know, there's really, really a strong focus on it. Um, um, I, th I found, though, during the audit, some of the patients' remarks to staff wasn't so much of this, if, if uh, hand washing was successful, it's whether or not we found if they liked that tech. They would make names, oh, yeah, they're great tech, they did a good job today, and not really focusing. So there again, I think patient education. And patients truly, truly need to be so educated in this because they hear about infection. They hear about so many things, you know that they just need to ingest it. Um, after, you know, the compliance, you know, to hand hygiene and staff response, it really changed. After the onset of the audit, management's efforts on education about and consistently reiterating, um, the staff did a huge turnaround. They were easily conversed with. It wasn't like 
you know, I'm saying something and I know better. It's like, okay, let's have an open dialogue on this. And they really listen. I even had one nurse who came over to me and, um, you know, had taken off his gloves and was going to get another pair and put them on. And he turned and saw me and he threw those gloves away and used sanitizer and put his new gloves on. You know, I mean, just a whole different mindset, which is great. And I think our hand hygiene standard in our unit is really, really high. The importance of hand hygiene is so huge. Staff constantly needs, I really feel that staff constantly needs to be aware that patients' lives depend on how they employ best practices. They need to keep a really open mindset to what patients say. Often staff come in and it's their job. They have a lot of people to put on. They have a short turnaround stuff. They have all the tubing and stuff. And they skip stuff, and it becomes a routine. They really, really need to take to heart. Each individual patient, we do not all run at the same pressure. We all don't feel the same way. Our symptoms are different, and that needs to be a big focus. Um, one of the things that I've realized since I've done this, I just got out of um, adult critical care, and um Unfortunately, and I'm a dialysis patient that never goes to the hospital unless I have a new graft put in, which I seem to be have quite a few because the old graft fail. But when I was in the emergency room and I was in critical care for three days, I never saw staff wash their hands or use sanitizer when they changed gloves. They changed gloves, but they didn't do that. Even the dialysis staff that came in to run me in my room did not. But fortunately, I was really able to have a good conversation with a nurse and a, dial- a nice, sweet, young dialysis staff who did change, you know, how they did. I really, truly feel that staff and patients need to make a conscientious, uh, concerted effort to reach a goal of high proficiency in procedures because this infection needs to be eradicated. It's not something we can have 15%. It's not something we can have 10%. I mean, this is my life. This is all of the other patients' lives, you know. And and it's a um, it's just education and working together. But it can't be a hit and miss. And if you thank you, Robin. Robin. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I really appreciate that you mentioned how it wasn't easy talking with staff at the beginning. So it's hard to make sure that people are giving true audit results and not going, "Well, I like this person and don't like this person." And I love the emphasis on the education and how you saw the improvement in your facility. So let's talk for a second about what we saw overall in the project. Uh, it was started in April of last year, uh, and as of day going, the patient audit showed a 76% success rate with hand hygiene. Um, as of October, the results were 94% successful, so we had an 80, or I'm sorry, not an 80, but an 18% improvement today. Uh, we had great participation from our facilities. We also had monthly web access and et cetera, and they submitted their data. We have facilities actually present uh, on these monthly calls and talk about how it was going. And I will give you in just a couple minutes some of the things that we saw. Um, some things we're going to consider as we do this this year is the initial verification from facilities, uh, task patients conduct hand hygiene audits, and we did have some struggle with our smaller facilities at times to find station volunteers to do audits. Um, we did have some on the project that had less than 25 patients. So what kind of comments did we see? Uh, the most difficult was engaging the staff and patients with truthful assessments. Uh, when the audits occurred, I was just placed as a new manager. The facility had one of the worst infection control practices I've seen in my 25 years in dialysis. We've improved our practice and our standing in infection has gone from the bottom 5% to the top 30%. Another note is we've improved uh, agreement with NOTA for both staff and patients. Another comment, the campaign resulted in improved focus on blood culture collection, improved focuses on cleanliness of dialysis patients during treatment, and increased focus on hand hygiene. And the last one I'll leave you with it was a very worthwhile project and help to make everyone more alert and aware of proper hand hygiene and the better use of PPE. So just to sum up, I'd really like to say that we found the hand hygiene project 
to be uh, very hesitant and not well received in the beginning. So by the end of the project, both the patients and the staff were very appreciative, really learned, and I think it'll help healthcare overall. As Robin uh, showed by saying she had taken it even out of the dialysis unit and into her unfortunate hospitalization. What kind of questions do you have for any of the patients or any of the speakers today? Please remember you will have to hit pound six because you have been muted. Robin, this is Vicki. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I had a question um, just in regards to having patients do that. Did you feel very uncomfortable at having to do audits, or did, it, did you feel um, that the staff responded to you in any different way when you were doing those audits? You know, at first I did, because whenever I got it, I'm a very, I feel, um, I'm a very corrupt patient. I have to be, you know, and so I like to do it, but you have to do it in a nice way. But when I first would bring up things, definitely there was some of it, not all of staff, because I have such good relationships there, that some felt that I, you know, they think you're a know-it-all or something like that, or, you know, they're in control and what do I have to say about it. But once the audit started, and I think one of the key things was management stepped in. Not only were we doing the audits, and I really didn't have to talk too much. I had really good, good discussions with some of the staff, and they, you know, really um, became more interested in it. And then I was also able to present at um, LAN or Network 16 gave me a great opportunity to present at the uh, provider meeting in October. I just, to me, that was great to be able to voice <laughs> and. Just because some people knew that I was doing it, it brought up great, great conversation. But they had to really be, um, that there was no, um, they were not, so they weren't intimidated that I was doing the audit. You know, it wasn't a negative, it wasn't about me saying, oh, this person is bad, 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 or something like that. It was like, let's get it and see how we can improve our practices. And once that began and management uh -huh. did huddles, you know, before they started shifts, the management got outside people in to monitor and stuff. And our standard is that facility, they're so proud, you know, has really gone up. But it's a really Thank hard you, work. Robin. We have two questions for came through in chat. One was how many patients left with the auditors. We are showing for this process as for volunteers. Uh, we thought we didn't want to force anybody. Uh, and of course, I think we all know that you get better compliance and a more energetic uh, response from those who actually volunteer. And there was a question about how much involvement do the physicians have in improving patient engagement. And I would have to say we really didn't involve physicians, and that might be something that we need to look at for the next round. I kind of think, I, myself personally, I think so, because my nephrologist is in charge of my care, and that is such a big piece, and um, they're also engaging, I, I, I don't mean to be rude, but engaging the doctors that come in in proper etiquette for hand washing. Because I uh, and then we have one more question that comes through. We'll probably have to use this as the last one. By all means, you can keep sending your questions in to either the NCC or to myself, and we'll be glad to answer them. But the last question that came through is, did you rotate auditors so that one individual was not, quote-unquote, under the gun? Uh, we actually left that up for the facilities. Uh, I think it kind of depended on the size of the facility, uh, how much rotation there was, and, of course, I think as time went on, we had more patients that were willing uh, to volunteer than there were at the beginning. And in our facility, they did audits every shift. So it wasn't you know, just And just uh, to wrap us up and bring us home, because we have just a couple minutes left, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, this is the CDC's uh, newest checklist for dialysis, which is the dialysis patient routine disinfection. Uh, we did have uh, facilities that uh, were using this with our patient land, but we did not have patients doing it. Again, the uh, audit tool for hand hygiene observations. And just a summary, 
Uh, as we know, ESRB patients are at high risk for healthcare acquired infections, healthcare acquired or associated, depending on who, infections are preventable through adhering to correct procedures and adapting to a culture of safety. And engaging patients and care partners as members of the infection prevention team can improve practices in your facility. So please take a minute. Uh, you do have a polling question up. And Vicki, at this point, I'll hand it back over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Barb and Robin. I think, you know, there's been a lot of great discussion here and obviously interest in starting a project like this, and, and I think it just really showed, and, and I love how engaged Robin is in her comment about physician and etiquette, too. I mean, we're all part of that team. So, uh, yeah, there, please fill out the evaluation if you are um, – a person who is looking for CEs, we need to have a completed evaluation in order to process the uh, CE request. So you'll see that in the polling questions on the side, and you can scroll down. If you complete it now and submit, it's all done in one nice electronic fashion. If not, um, Walter, if you can pull up the slides and share with the team about submitting for CEs um, going forward. Uh, Walter, Barbara, you have the presenter rights, so Barbara, can you pass back to Walter? Yeah, Barbara, if you could pass back to presenter rights, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, Walter. It's coming, Walter. I think there's just a delay from the West Coast to the East. Uh, okay. One more announcement here. Um, you're seeing it up on your screen as you're filling out your evaluation. Uh, there actually is a WebEx in two days um, with uh, the ARC group in engaging patients and partners in care. So you might, if you can spare the time, want to jump on this WebEx. It's giving you the information to register. It will also be at our website if you're looking around for it. But uh, this will be a nice kind of continuation of this theme. It might give you more strategies and ways to get that patient engagement and involvement going. So we encourage your attendance on that event. And then, uh, Walter, if we could go through our couple slides here just to share with you all. If you are unable to fill out the poll online, you can go to our website and manually complete the evaluation and submit that to us. We would we email all of the um, QE certificates out to you uh, within four to six weeks of the event. So please give us a little time to process your attendance and the submission of your evaluation. If you have a group of people who have sat in a room and listened, they will all need to individually fill out evaluations, and they can either um, do that online or um, and submit that afterwards, and they will be also included to get their CEs. And I thank you to Barbara um, Reckler for your presentation today and for Robin and Jasper and Elizabeth. We really appreciate all of your time and the great strategies and work that you have done together to eliminate HAIs. And I hope that um, more people who involve patients and listen to the patients um, in that care infection team. So thank you so much. Any other comments or closing remarks, Barbara? No, thank you, everyone, and have a great day. All right, thank, thank you, guys. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye.